Hey, Rafael, how are you? Hey, Mark, I'm good, man. How are you? Fine. Just some thoughts about getting the third pick and, and, how, and how that is just, how the strategy might be different from going one, two, three, or four, or five, how that all affects when you're at number three. Um, I don't think it's terribly different. Obviously, I, I think the difference is really how other teams uh, interact with us, maybe. Um, I think the process in terms of drafting the pick will be identical if we have three, two, if we have two or one, just in terms of, you know, we'll, 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 we'll go through all the same work um, or four or five for that matter. Um, and then I do think as it relates maybe to potentially change uh, trading it um, um, that, that might, um, that might change how teams perceive it. It might not depending upon, who a team's target is. So I, I think that's the answer. Greg Bailey. Rafael, congratulations on another uh, pick. I, I know you guys had to go into the night understanding you were to leave this process with a really good player, but, but third in a, in a draft with a lot of talent at the top, how good do you feel about being in that third position and adding yet another elite type talent to the young core that you already had? Yeah, we feel really good. We're really excited. Um, we, you know, I, I definitely think whether by picking third or by, uh, you know, a trade or whatever we end up doing, I, I think we're going to be a materially more talented team um, this coming season than we were this last one. And and uh, that's exciting. So so we're really we're, we're, we're really happy. Ali Khan Bajani. Rafael, excuse me, even after taking four rookies last year, how do you debate about picking the best player available at three versus best fit? I, I think you always have to go best player available. Um, fundamentally, it's our job to win championships. And so I think um, when you're picking this high in the draft, I, I think you just you want to see if you can get somebody who can be, you know, really um, a cornerstone of your franchise. And so I, I think. I think fit is going to necessarily be secondary. Jason Bristol. Rafael, do you go into this um, type of situation, a draft lottery with like a dividing line in your mind that, okay, I feel really good if we're at this number compared to, I mean, I knew you are going to get in the top five, but did you feel like there was a, a dividing number or dividing line where you really wanted to be at? No, uh, -uh. no. I mean, I mean, last year there was <laughs> but i think i think this year no i think this year we we felt like we were gonna we were gonna be in a position to bring in a talented basketball player and um you know the the macro strategy i think remains the same the micro probably changes a little bit um but honestly we had you know we've been doing our work on an individual basis of getting prepared for the draft um but but we haven't spent real time on strategy intentionally. So I think, you know, the pick will inform our strategy. But, um, um, you know, but, I, I you know, I'm excited. I think I think we'll end up in a good spot. Brian Bearfield. Rafael, when you have um, when you have a, a situation like this where you are selecting third overall, how hard is it to block out other general managers who, you know, may be trying to get that pick and block it out so you can concentrate on who you want to select? Well, I'm definitely not going to block them out. If they want to talk, I'm always available to talk. So, yeah, no, I, I mean, I don't listen to other people. Um, I don't listen to other general. They, they don't tell me who to pick. So I, I, I've not, I've not had another general manager call me and tell me who to pick. Um, but but if, if, you know, if it's the case that they, that they are interested in doing something, you know, we're, we're always available to listen. And, and if there's something that makes sense for both teams, something will get done. Saman Ali. Rafael, you talked about how you want, at, at this point in the draft, you're looking for someone who could potentially be a franchise cornerstone type of talent for you guys. Uh, when you look at this specific draft, how many of those players do you, do you see and I apologize, I missed the earlier part of the press conference. Did you, you talked about potentially moving this pick. How open are you to moving the pick? And how seriously are you going to take those discussions going into July? No, we're definitely, we're definitely open to it. Um, I, that's kind of an important part of my personal philosophy is that you always want to be open to those things because you never know 
you never know what's going to be available and you never want to foreclose those types of opportunities. Um, I do think that there's going to be an exceptionally talented player. Um, when I said cornerstone, I wasn't necessarily talking about this draft per se. I was just talking more about when you're picking high in the draft um, and the, the fit versus, uh, I guess, potential um, um, or fit versus talent um, argument. Um, but I do think there's really talented players in this draft. There, there are super talented players in every draft and it's just going to be up to us to, to try and weed through. And, and if we do pick the, you know, end up using the pick to find the very best guy we can get. Jackson Gatlin. Hey, Rafael, congrats on pick number three. Um, I know you just touched on this a moment ago, talking about kind of best player available fit and whatnot. But when you look at this current Rockets roster, are there any guys on this roster that you maybe take into account a little bit further as to how they might pair with some of these top prospects? You know, I mean, I, I think um, there certainly are players on this roster that we feel really, really good about and that we're really excited about and that we think, you know, can be with us for a long time we can win a lot of games with and and hopefully even win a championship with um but having said that kind of one of my fundamental beliefs is that great players can play with great players so again i i i think the real answer is no but not because we don't have exceptionally talented basketball players who i'm really excited about it's it's more just people can adjust to one another. And especially like when you're talking about players, the eight, you know, of the ages, most of our guys are, um, you know, they, they, they can, they're, they're, they all are getting better on a daily basis and need to get better on a daily basis. And so um, if somebody has got an exceptional strength and somebody else has a weakness um, you know, you can hedge one another and do other things. So um, again, I, I, I do think we're in a position where we can just try and figure out who the most talented player is. Adam Wexler. Rafael, obviously the process as they're going through the envelope unveiling is pretty quick, but are you having any emotions as the Kings move up? Are you keeping track of where things stand as they get through nine, six, five, four, and on down to your pick? Yeah, I mean, it's just math. So it's hard for me not to do the math. And I think the Kings were the only team that moved up. So, um, uh, so you know, so it was just like, you know, hoping that, uh, you know, it's always better to pick higher than lower. So, you know, you, you, I, I definitely was keeping track, but um, yeah, I think that's the answer. Michael Shapiro. Hi, Rochelle. You know, with last year's pick, Jalen Green, it was certainly, you know, an investment in a player's ceiling, so to speak. Do you still kind of view this as a situation where, you know, you're going to take a player with the highest ceiling or are you moving toward rebuild where, uh, you know, perhaps it's a four or what is their uh, worst case or middle case scenario situation? I understood the ceiling part, but I, I didn't understand the second part of your question. Just how much is is ceiling one of your top priorities, I guess, is the most simple way to put it. I mean, in the abstract, it's the single most important one, but mm -hmm. but in reality, like you no one would pick somebody who has a ceiling at 99 and a floor at one if they could pick a guy who had a ceiling at 98 and a floor at 97. Sure. So um so, you know, it, it is, it's obviously important, but, but it's not the only determining factor. Um, and, um, but yeah, we, we do, I, I generally do think that, you know, having our game rewards size and athleticism. And so if, if you can find, you know, hyper athletic people who are really big and are also good at the game, they're going to, they're going to have an advantage over somebody who's maybe a little less athletic and a little less, uh, less big, but also good at the game. Um, you know, so, um, I don't know. I, I didn't do a good job answering your question, but, um, but, but I do think, yeah, ceiling, ceiling is very important. No, you're great. Appreciate it. Adam Spolin. Eight on the shot clock. Hey, Rafael. Um, do you start to look at positional or not positional diversity, but like a diversity just with skill set with where you guys are? I know you've always said that you're not really worried about position, but do you don't try to avoid uh, like skill set redundancy? Um, I don't think so. No, I mean, if, if anything, you you try and avoid the opposite, which is like, you know, in the NBA, you do need you need to be able to space the floor. You need people who can shoot. So it, it's maybe redundancy of people whose weaknesses are the same, 
but I think having people, having a lot of people who are highly skilled, I think actually, um, I, I, I think it actually can really help you and, um, and, and can, can have some multiplier effects sometimes. Ben DeBose. Rafael, what's the balance the next few weeks between what you see on tape from this past season with these guys versus what you guys hopefully see in the workouts you complete with them? Oh, I mean, it's, it's 99% tape, 1% workout. Mm. You know, you, you just have to be, you know, you have to be very, very careful with making it judgments over on, a, you know, based on a single day. We'll take three more. Randy McElvoy. Hey, Rafael, uh, just to follow up to that last question a little bit, I, I was going to ask you, just how do you you and your staff approach these next 30 days when it comes to evaluation? What you already don't, you know, what you already know about these guys is most of the legwork done already. And how do you use this, this next month to prepare to make the decision? Yeah, for us as a group, I think individually, we, we've all done our work already. Um, and we've well, not all of it, but we 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 are we're well versed. Probably all of us are on each of the individual players. What we haven't done, and what we're going to really use this this next period of time to do, is to really um, challenge one another's assumptions and and ask questions that maybe um, you know maybe Eli will ask, you know will raise a concern about a player that I hadn't thought of, um, and and really drill down in the hopes that we that that we come to the best decision about kind of uh, people's future looking prospects as as we can. Kelly Eco. Hey Rafael, is there almost some kind of a relief because now picking three, you can really focus on the best player available and have to do all the legwork to, to hone on that decision? I do think there's a sense of relief just in that like it, it is this kind of weird thing where you don't you're doing work and you don't know what you're dealing with. And so there is a sense of relief. Okay, now we know we're picking through. Now everything is done. Let's let's let let's let's finish preparing and really, and and really kind of finish the process. And and so it is kind of a step done type of relief. That's what I would. That that's how I would explain it. And last question, Jonathan Fagan. Um, Rafael, to whatever degree you were happy to have heard your name at number three. Whatever, however happy you are with that, how much of that was informed with the work you have done to this point and your feelings about the players, one of which you know will be available at third at three? Yeah, I, I, I think if we end up picking, we we will have the ability to pick a really, really talented basketball player at three. I I do I, I've definitely done enough work so that I think I think that is that is the case. And you know, it's on us to pick the right player, and it's on us to develop the player. And it's and it's on the player who ultimately comes to, again, assuming we even pick it. So you didn't do anything on camera, did you fist bump inside in your your own thoughts or no. uh, do, did you cheer at all to your to yourself? No, I mean it's you know, at least with this particular draft, I think it just is. And so like I said, there's a sense of relief of, of being able, okay, this is the spot we're picking in. Now let's, now let's build a plan. Let's go forward. Let's, let's do all the work. Let's have all the conversations. Um, but, but, but no, I, I, I was definitely not, definitely not like disappointed and definitely not celebrating. I, I, I think, you know, I, I think we're very, you know, um, I, you know, I, I think we have a plan that we, that we firmly believe in and, and we think that, uh, you know, we're on track. I, I thought that yesterday. I think that now. Thank you.